Um, I want to say welcome to everybody who's registered for tonight's AJON event. It's great to have everybody here. Um, IOAging.org is our website. Institute on Aging's mission is um, very much uh, one of making sure that people can live independently in their homes as long as possible. So if you go to our website, www.ioaging.org, you'll see all the great services that we provide and um, read more about us there. Thank you. Um, again, everyone is muted this evening. So if you would like to ask questions, which will be um, taken by the panelists after the, the about the half hour or so mark, use the Q&A feature or even the chat feature. And I, the moderator, will, I'm not really the moderator, but the person who's um, introducing, will keep track of the questions and then present those to our guests at the end. Um, I want to thank again Pippa Gordon, MSW, who is on our staff for um, introducing us to David um, and ensuring that he uh, was able to present this evening. I also want to thank Dr. Jim Davis for his support of the Age On program of the department. My name is Catlin Morgan. I'm the education manager of IO Aging. And I also want to thank my colleague, Glenn Fishman, who's the Senior Program Coordinator uh, of the Elder Abuse Prevention Program, who's lurking in the background and helping with the Zoom uh, features. Um, we will be listening to the panelists for about a half hour before they take the questions. At this time, I'd like to introduce the panelists. David Talbot is a well-known San Francisco author, journalist, and media entrepreneur. He's the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The Devil's Chessboard and Brothers, as well as the national bestseller, Season of the Witch. And his most recent book, his memoir, Between Heaven and Hell, was published in 2019 by Chronicle Books. This is the story he'll be exploring tonight, which is the story of his stroke and subsequent recovery. Along with him as moderator is Rebecca Riley, MA, CCC SLP. She's a certified speech language pathologist at California Pacific Medical Center, practicing in the acute rehab, skilled nursing, and outpatient settings. And she will be speaking with David tonight. She actually was there at the onset of his stroke and the actually the and the subsequent rehabilitation. So I am going to mute myself now, leave the room, let these two begin their conversation, and then I will take your questions. I will be watching your questions in the Q&A and chat and present those to the two presenters. Without further ado, thank you, David, and thank you, Rebecca, for being with us this evening. Great. Well, <clears throat> I will jump in then, and <laughs> since uh, I uh, wrote the book, uh, <laughs> uh, I am David Talbot. I'm glad to be here, and I'm so glad to be in conversation with Rebecca, who, as Catlin said, and by the way, thank you, Catlin and Glenn and Pippa for uh, setting this up today. Um, Rebecca, I have eternally fond feelings for. Um, you know, the first 48 hours of my stroke, uh, which happened back in two, 2017, were particularly, you know, um, uh, terrifying. And uh, I was kind of out of it, as you can imagine. I was uh, in the middle of a 48-hour, what they call stuttering stroke. I think Rebecca saw me uh, after maybe the first 24 hours, and she can tell you more from a clinical point of view, the kind of enormous challenges I had ahead. Uh, she and the staff didn't know at that point uh, whether I was going to be so severely damaged. I wouldn't, uh, I couldn't, you know, be uh, of use, <laughs> or I couldn't, re you know, uh, rehabilitate. Um, so, you know, uh, through the grace of whatever, uh, whatever you believe in. Uh, I am still here, and I lived through the stroke, and uh, not, not only that, but came back to, to speak again. I couldn't speak. I was a complete mess. I couldn't speak. I couldn't swallow. I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. Um, you know, I was severely damaged, 
And uh, Rebecca assured me at some point, she worked very carefully, painstakingly with me for five weeks. I was uh, at the stroke ward at Davies. And she assured me at one point that I would speak again in public. And here I am speaking again in public. So uh, I owe a, a huge debt of gratitude, obviously, to Rebecca, to the entire staff at Davies, and to my family and friends who hung in there with me and, and kept believing in me, frankly, before I did. So, you know, Rebecca was one of the first ones who, who, who uh, you know, worked with me very carefully every day on my speech, uh, you know, instruct me how to be more clear, and I hope I'm being clear. Rebecca, <laughs> it's not your fault if I'm not. <laughs> she has not been my therapist for some time now. Anyway, I will quit yapping and let Rebecca jump in here at this point. Well, yapping is an opportunity to practice your speech. <laughs> um, no, David is, is correct. Uh, I mean, and I met you quite early on. Um, we talked about one of my coworkers had, um, knew I was working on the weekend and said, you know, oh, I just saw this amazing gentleman, um, his swallowing, I'm, I'm worried about his secretions, about swallowing his own saliva. Um, and of course, then we worry about aspiration pneumonia, um, which is uh, food or liquid or your own saliva getting into your airway and, and creating a case of pneumonia. So she said, you know, can you check up on him? And um, I did, and you were lovely. I believe Camille was there too. Everyone was wonderful. And um, I walked out hoping you would not be intubated by the time I came back on Monday. So you had a lot of work to do and, and you did it. Um, it's been quite a journey and I cannot believe, you know, three years later, we're on a Zoom call during a pandemic. <laughs> um, uh, you asked me, you know, you said the other day, I hope I was a success. And I said, well, I mean, you wrote a book, so <laughs> yes. Um, but it was, it was, you put in a lot of work and, uh, and it was pretty remarkable. Um, everything, you know, what's, what's lovely about Davies is uh, we have the ability to follow someone, the whole continuum of care from acute to acute rehab uh, outpatient as well. And so it, it has been a remarkable journey. I can't ex explain that or say that enough. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe we should talk uh, specifically, Rebecca, about some of the work that you had to do with me. Um, you know, as you said, I couldn't, I mean, one of the first things I remember actually was a uh, disgusting procedure you put me through, where yes. I had to swallow, was it beryllium? No, uh, barium. So barium. one of the ways that we assess swallows instrumentally, I mean, we can, you know, check it out at bedside, um, uh, is a procedure done in radiology um, where you do ingest barium and it's various consistencies of barium. It took a little bit of coaxing to get you to go down. <laughs> um, I can't believe people don't want to swallow barium. Uh, and um, we basically watched where it went. So I gave you thin nectar thick barium, which is um, like pancake syrup, honey thick barium, which is honey thick, and then mixed in kind of a pudding consistency into different food textures. And we watched, you know, where your swallow was breaking down um, and what you could swallow. And I think we eventually, the first thing we did was put you on a, a pureed diet with nectar thick liquids. Um, uh, no one says I'm so That's thirsty. By the way. I don't think I have a really an appetite for that anymore. No. Yeah. no. I think the worst thing I had to do, other than the barium drink, which was pretty awful, um, was to drink uh, every liquid had a thickening agent in it. Yes. And uh, <laughs> um, you, you really get quite nauseated quite early by that. It did help me lose a lot of weight, which I had to do, because <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to ingest. But um, no, I think, you know, what I got so much from Rebecca and, you know, from several others uh, of her colleagues on the staff who I could name later um, is a sense of hope, as I said earlier, and optimism. And I know there's a fine line, Rebecca, between, you know, giving a patient false hope. And, you know, we see that with uh, President Trump, right, uh, today at the Walter Reed Hospital, where his uh, personal physician is being attacked, I think, very uh, fairly for being a spin doctor more than a medical doctor. So obviously you have to be able to be honest with the patient, but there's, I say, a fine line between that and really kind of uh, bumming them out so much that they don't have the will to try and, and work at rehabilitating. 
And I think, you know, you were great that way because you, you challenged me every day. There was, you know, speech exercises we had to do. You would bring me more difficult things to eat and swallow. I thought I could never eat a, what, a bagel again <laughs> or, or, or <laughs> grape. Bagel. I remember grape because of the skin on the grape. It's very difficult for a stroke uh, survivor to uh, swallow. Um, so there are certain things that, you know, were f terrifying to me, but you kept challenging me and, you know, not just you, but others, my family and others had to watch me eat often to make sure I didn't aspirate, as you say, or choke. And so every meal was kind of a challenge for many months, actually. Uh, it continued to be even after I got home. Um, you know, it was somewhat frightening just to eat and certain things in particular. And now, hey, I'm eating nuts and grape nuts. <laughs> <laughs> but not like a truck driver. There's no guzzling. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine what it was like. I mean, yes, you know, it's, we eat for sustenance, we eat for pleasure, and having to worry about every single bite, you know, um, whether it be an ice chip or a cookie. Um, but I, what I feel like was so remarkable about you, and I realize I'm using that word a lot, but it, it characterizes you well, is that you were facing, not just in the domain of speech and swallowing, you were facing challenges in um, walking, in transferring from your bed to your wheelchair. Um, how do you open a toothpaste tube and brush your teeth? And you know all of those things, you were being bombarded from, from every side and, and meeting those challenges head on. Um, yeah, th you really, uh don't realize how broken you can be by a certain medical, you know, crisis. And, mm -hmm. and I felt completely broken. I mean, I couldn't, as you say, brush my teeth, like, uh, without help. Uh, I couldn't brush my hair. I couldn't shave. I couldn't tie my shoelaces. You know, that was continued to be a big challenge throughout the five weeks I was at the hospital was tying my shoes uh, and, and actually buttoning a, a shirt, particularly on the, the left side, uh, because my right side is still somewhat paralyzed. Um, and, you know, I had vision issues, which I continue to have. And uh, I knew I wasn't going to be quite the same. And Rebecca knows this, um, <laughs> we won't name the doctor, uh, but I do name uh, the incident and describe the incident where one doctor on staff, you know, came in, basically told me that I was a mess and would always be a mess the rest of my life. So something told me I, I was not going to be a complete lost cause. I, my worst fear was that I would be a burden on my family. And I, I'm sure Rebecca's heard that many, many times from many patients. But that was my worst fear. You know, my mother had, had uh, a brain aneurysm and then a series of strokes, which killed her at a young age, younger than I was at the time. I was 67 when the, the stroke hit me. And she died at age 60. And so that was very much in my mind because she was not the same person after her initial brain trauma. It, it affected her personality and her ability to speak and communicate. She was very sweet, but she wasn't all there. And my aunt, actually, her sister, went through that at an even younger age. I think she was in her late 30s. She was a nurse in Los Angeles, and she'd suffered um, a brain aneurysm, and, and uh, it was even more devastating. So, um, you know, those were, those family kind of uh, tragedies were in my mind as I lay in bed at Davies. But something told me that I still had enough of a, of a mind, of an intellect, to uh, be able to keep working at it. And, and it's very, very hard work. Every time Rebecca would come in with speech exercises, or Nell, one of my physical therapists, came in to get me out of bed, even getting out of bed is, is a daunting task in the beginning. Uh, to walk with me and you know, make sure I wouldn't fall. Uh, walking was really plodding and painstaking kind of uh, you know, trial. I, I was doing block exercises like a kid, you know, um, to put the block in the right you know, hole. And uh, they're timing me, you know, these were, uh, I guess, exercises in dexterity. Um, and it reminded me, my dad, who's an old movie actor, was uh, <laughs> in a movie called uh, 30,000 30, Years in Sing Sing. And uh, they test the prisoners, 
you know, mental competence at one point, but I haven't even put the blocks in the right hole. And my dad was apparently a genius by convict standards because they were amazed at his ability. But my own ability to put the blocks in the right hole at the time was not very good. So, you know, there are days when you feel completely uh, kind of defeated, you know, depressed. Um, and yet, I have to say, Rebecca, your kind of attitude every day, and you would come in the morning because you knew I was a journalist, you knew I was a news junkie, you'd have the newspapers, you'd read to me the latest stories, we laughed at them because, you know, what seems as like a tragedy to the nation as a whole can be very amusing when you have a stroke. <laughs> Um, well, you know, I mean, I saw you almost every day, uh, at least Monday through Friday. I was working on the weekends. I'd pick you up if I could, um, but for just an hour. So, you know, you mentioned your mood, and I know that this would be helpful also for individuals who are maybe not necessarily the same, like with a stroke or any other sort of, sort of medical calamity. How did you push through that? You know, again, I think it was a sense, an innate sense, that I had enough left in me mentally mm -hmm. that, um, that it was worth my effort even, and as well as the effort of other people to keep working. And um, I, I knew that I would never be the same. I write about this in my book. I, I realized that early on. I mean, this doctor, this brain surgeon was very, you know, dark. But, you know, he had a point. I was never going to be the same person I was before I had my stroke. And so I, I think I, I had to face that at some point. There was a lot of what ifs, you know, for a certain period, not, not that long, maybe, you know, a week where I would just lay in bed going, what if I had driven myself into the hospital and I'd gotten the TPA administered, you know, which uh, bust the clot. I, my stroke was caused by a, a blood clot. And of course, many patients are saved by that, but I didn't realize what was happening me, to me until too late because that window had closed. That window, I think Rebecca can speak to this, but it's only a, three or four hours or around that. And, and by the time I realized I was having my stroke, it was about 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there were a lot of what ifs. It, and then once I let that go and realized I'm not gonna be the same person and I have to say goodbye to that person. And it's almost as if you're burying a good friend, you're, you're at a funeral for a good friend. Then once I let go of that, person I'd been, I could start focusing on this new person who was emerging, who in some ways, as I write in the book, I kind of liked better than the old person. You know, the old person was really driven, was uh, often very angry, kind of, because um, having to meet deadlines all the time, having to make money, having to, uh, you know, conquer the world. As a journalist, I wasn't just kind of a, a journalist, I was also uh, a missionary. And I started Salon back in 1995 at the beginning of the dot-com era to actually revolutionize journalism because my own profession really, you know, disappointed me. <laughs> and so there were so many ambitions I had that I knew I wasn't going to realize. And I'd come to the age of 67 where I wasn't really that happy a person, I think. I was overweight. I was stressed out. And I was shuttling back and forth to Hollywood where we we're trying to translate one of my books into a TV series. It, another endlessly frustrating experience, which probably gave me a stroke because I write one chapter. Um, but I think, you know, as I say, I began to like this new person that was emerging in the hospital. He had more of a sense of humor, like the old days I did. He was looser, you know, friendlier. And I was really interested actually in all the people in the hospital there's a parade of people coming through, not only Rebecca, but doctors, you know, shrinks, uh, acupuncturists. <laughs> uh, and I was open to any kind of thing at that point. That was another part of me that was a kind of new, that I was, sure, acupuncture, never had it. Let's try it. Um, but anyway, uh, that's, I, I really focused on this new me. I think that's what it was, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you embraced it well. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, the staff is, is rather eclectic at the, at the Davies campus. Well, I, I mean, I can only speak primarily to Davies because that's my mothership, but um, we're pretty fortunate with the staff that we do have. It's uh, the longevity, the um, collective knowledge, uh, the passion, you know, the patient first, everyone's patient first mindset. 
and I'm sure other facilities again have that, but um, you know, I, I find that my home uh, is, is pretty amazing. So. Well, it did, it became home for me, a second family, all of you. Um, and of course there were certain people like you that I was a little more in, you know, eager to see than others. Um, the night shifts were kind of a strange crew. <laughs> um, but even there you had some really heroes and angels that, uh, that kept me going because, you know, it's a 24 uh, seven kind of process when you're in a hospital as a patient, they wake you up all night long to make sure your vitals are still working and all that, you know, or to administer, uh, you know, new medication or in my case to catheterize me because I couldn't pee on my own for I think four weeks. I only started doing it the last week and it was a great event for the whole staff <laughs> at the hospital as well as me. Yeah. Um, so you know it was like a family and uh, in the dark hours of night when you're up at three or four in the morning and you you know you don't have your own family there or friends. I mean you really do depend on these people, these angels of the night who are coming into your room to talk to you. I, you know, I'm a journalist, so I tend to interview people. As Rebecca said, the staff at Davies, the stroke board is quite amazing. And they're, you know, I don't know if it's still the case, but they were from all around the world, uh, Cambodia, you know, people whose parents came from Cambodia, uh, you know, Tasmania, Brazil, Germany, Russia, Guatemala. So, um, it was to me, a, a, you know, a complete fuck you to the Trump view of the world that where we live with borders and walls, because you know it was a truly international group of people who were putting me together. I mean, you mentioned the Davies family. I'd have to say your your own family is, is quite amazing uh, and special as well. I wish we could have rented them out to everyone <laughs> um, <laughs> and the support they provided. I mean, it was always like a party in your room. <laughs> uh, from from the purple lights to, to people coming in and reading and um and the conversations and it was just it was pretty special to be a part of you know to roll in and like oh yeah well you know um thank you and my family continues to be you know a huge source of uh, strength to me but you know you don't really appreciate people you love and sometimes until you uh, are completely dependent on them. And they came from all around the country. My sister, Margaret, who's a great writer at the New Yorker magazine, uh, flew in from Washington, DC. And, and uh, I always loved Margaret's kind of nutty sense of humor. And so that was very important to me then. She and Camille, my wife, Camille Perry, who's another writer, they're very close friends. And they were the ones who put up purple lights. It was going to be Christmas time. And I just thought, eh, you know, green and red, that's kind of boring. So they went for purple or lavender, I think. Um, and they did make it kind of a party room with music and all that. And, you know, I had a feeling that, you know, it's not always fun to be working on the stroke board. And I tried to create my room or make my room into kind of a fun place, not just for my family and visitors, but for the staff as well. Um, I was going to say one more thing about that. Oh, yeah. Um, the other key thing that was happening at the time was my oldest son, Joe Talbot, uh, was incubating or about to start directing his very first feature film, which is The Last Black Man in San Francisco. And he won the Best Director Award for that movie at Sundance. You know, he was going through all sorts of, you know, anxieties and stress himself about, you know, imagine a young guy in his 20s directing his first feature with Hollywood money behind it. Um, you know, it's a, a story that he'd been developing with his best friend, Jimmy Fales, who was the co-star of the film for years since they were kids. And so it was a huge moment for Joe. And none of us, of course, I had faith in him, his ability, because I'd seen him as a young kid just directing movies. But I remember him coming into my room at all hours. And, you know, sometimes he was he was more wiped out than I was more anxious. And uh, but I, I think the, the staff all began to sort of get excited about Joe's prospects and what he was working on. And I was so happy, Rebecca, when you got to come to the Alamo uh, Draft House Theater. Hey, in the old days, we went to movie theaters. Yeah, we sat shoulder to shoulder and ate. <laughs> it's amazing. Exactly. Uh, when the film did open uh, in San Francisco, uh, when was it? Last summer. So um, 
you know, that to me was, a, again, a sign that there is hope. Uh, here I was living to see my son direct mm -hmm. his first feature film. I was on the set, you know, for two or three days while he was directing uh, in the streets of San Francisco and in the old mansion that was the uh, subject of the film. And I, I just would think to myself, my God, you know, I, I said goodbye to my, my family the first night of the stroke because I really thought I was dying. And, uh, and here I am, I'm getting to witness this amazing event with Joe and like 60, 70, 80 people running around, you know, laying cable and, and police stopping traffic and all the things that go into making a movie. And uh, my son is this calm kind of, uh, you know, commander in chief in the middle of all this chaos. So, you know, I was just, I said another prayer uh, at that moment that I was so fortunate to be there. How would you, I mean, you've had this journey that's, I mean, how could we have foreseen that, right? How would you summarize all of that? And what would you, basically, what would you tell someone who, if someone today is where you were in 2017, what advice would you give to them? Well, again, it depends, you know, you've seen people on all sorts of, I think, uh, all sorts of places on the spectrum. And I ask you, Rebecca, you know, because you did, you did come to hear me speak the first time, I think, in public uh, when we were still doing that right before the shutdown at Cafe Zoetrope in North Beach. And it was a lovely evening. And afterwards, I asked you because I was curious suddenly. We were walking back to your home and I said, hey, Rebecca, how many people that you see in the stroke board actually come back to have some normalcy, sense of normalcy in their lives? And, uh, you know, and despite all the damage I have, I do think that I lead a productive life. And I think what you told me, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rebecca, but I think you said only like 10% of your patients actually go on to resume productive lives in some way. Um, Is that wrong? You know, I can't, can't remember what I said because I say <laughs> a lot of things. Um, I don't know what percent because it, for us, it's so rare to see someone come back and visit us. You know, we're, we're kind of a, um, a stop, um, like a bus stop or a train stop for a lot of people. And um, so some, you know, and we're regional. Our, our rehab unit is regional. So we get people from Hawaii, from Oregon, uh, Nevada. Um, we've had people from overseas. And um, so there's a percent that, you know, can't come back to us for, because of physical limitations or transportation limitations. Um, there are an, a number who do come back and, um, you know, have not necessarily gone back to work. You know, most of our, our patients with strokes are older, but we do have some who are, are in their 20s or 30s. Um, there's been only one David Talbot who <laughs> decided to write a book about it. <laughs> um, uh, but yet not, not as many as I would hope come back uh, right. and to the, to the level that you have. Well, that was another thing that actually was um, shocking to me. Dr. Michael Key, uh, who's I think a great uh, neurosurgeon who's attached to your unit. Um, and I saw him uh, after I was released from the hospital and uh, he's actually the subject of one of my chapters. But he was saying that he's seeing more patients, uh, stroke patients who are younger and younger, as you say, some in their 20s and 30s, which to me was shocking. And he was saying that a lot of these people work in very stressful occupations in the tech industry and so on. Mm -hmm. They work 24 seven, they take drugs to keep going, they're overweight, they have high blood pressure, they have all the cofactors that you know add up to disaster often. And that really depressed me to think of people at that young an age who don't have enough balance in their lives and are driving themselves uh, towards some trauma like that. Um, you know, I, so, you know, that, that's one message actually that I'd like to give. And I like my sons, my own sons to learn from my experience. I, like I say, I have a son who's a director and I have another son who's in school and is pursuing his own path, he's younger. Uh, looking to do maybe some kind of psychiatric social work he's inter interested in now. But, um, you know, I hope that both of them develop sort of more harmonious 
kind of relationships with their life than I, than I did. And it's not like I didn't have a great life. I have had a great life. And when I said goodbye to my family that first night, um, I meant it that I felt I'd lived a full life and I was content to, let, to, to die, you know, at that point. But the truth is, I wouldn't like to have died under such a cloud. I wanted my sons in particular to see their dad kind of readjust in a more kind of peaceful way to life. And to, in some ways, it's funny because you incorporate death into your life. You have a near death experience like that and it never leaves you, or at least it's never left me. It's always a shadow there. I, in some ways, I feel I was reborn, not to become religious, but I feel like I was resurrected in some strange way. And I feel like the new me is kind of, um, you know, wasn't supposed to be here even. So every day I wake up, I still feel grateful. And, uh, you know, I did write this book right away. It came pouring out of me, this memoir about my stroke. Uh, it came easier than anything I've ever written. I was delighted that I could still write again. Um, you know, write, even typing was, a, was difficulty because one hand was kind of more like a claw. <laughs> so I still make more mistakes on my keypad than I'd like to. Uh, writing technically can still be a, a challenge. But, you know, just to be able to like do what you do and uh, enjoy it was such a joy to me. And so now every day, you know, my sons were all locked in with me for, uh, and Jimmy too, Jimmy Fails, the actor from Last Black Man, who's like a third son. Um, we were all locked in together, my wife, Camille, and I, all five of us for the first three months of the uh, pandemic. And uh, that was interesting. Joe was supposed to go off to Hollywood and he couldn't. Um, we were all locked together. And I was determined that they see a different dad, you know, a dad who's more patient, a dad who was more focused on them and not as driven um, because that's the way I've, I've felt by and large ever since the stroke. So as I say, I write in the book, the stroke didn't just change my life. In some ways it, it, it saved my life. Which I feel like is a very unique perspective that not many people say. And it's, it's, it's unique also that you, that you, it's you've been able to transition and 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 it seems come to peace with that too with with your new normal um are there things that you do miss i mean i'm sure there are things that you do miss doing yeah you know uh daily things you know like i used to love just jumping in the car hey i grew up in la so <laughs> car culture i used to like driving up to you know point Reyes or just getting out of the city uh you know i felt it gave me a sense of freedom when the city became too kind of claustrophobic and I can't drive anymore, you know, because I have limited vision in this eye and uh, driving would endanger myself and others. So I, I can't do that. And, uh, you know, I walk outside with a cane. I have to be careful. I'm kind of, I have a low level of dizziness still left over. It's probably going to be with me the rest of my life. And a little bit of paralysis, as I said, on my right side. So, you know, um, I'm not the person I was physically before, but I'm happier with the person I am psychologically, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I was gonna ask you, Rebecca, talking about work and going how the thing that amazed me about you and your colleagues was how you could come to work. In, in, in many ways, it, it's a, I know, exhilarating place to come because you see life and death writ large in a way we don't see normally. But in other ways, it can be quite, you know, grim. I know while I was there in the five weeks, there were, you know, some patients you saw weren't going to make it, or they were much more damaged than I was. So how do you do it psychologically, someone like you? Because you have a great spirit, but how do you do it day in and day out? Um, you know, I, I think that, I mean, I'll speak for me, but I, I think for a lot of my coworkers, and we enjoy what we do. Um, I had a lot of friends that went into um, other fields that you know, made a lot more money, required a lot more time, uh, but did not have the same sense of fulfillment. So it is hard work at times, but you know, we're making a difference. Um, we all have probably a pretty healthy sense of humor. <laughs> um, so you know, laughing, uh, something that you did quite a bit of, you know, is, is helpful. Um, having a positive mindset. Yes, it is hard at times, but, um, you know, reframing what wins are, 
you know, yes, someone cannot walk, but hey, they were able to stand up for the first time. Um, you know, someone cannot maintain uh, adequate nutrition, hydration orally, so they maybe have a feeding tube, but they are able to get, you know, a little bit more in every day. You know, so it's, it's reframing what the win is and um, readjusting goals and finding um, the positive in things. And, it, and sometimes you're digging deep and it, it takes some time, but also it's, you know, having amazing patients like you and family members and our coworkers. Um, I, I think I mentioned, you know, we have a lot of long, longevity at, uh, at Davies on our unit. Um, you know, some people have been there for over 20, 25, maybe closer to 30 years. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a great place to work. And so our coworkers also help us with that. Yeah. Um, well that, you know, the spirit was, was so important to me, uh, you know, every day. And, and in fact, as you say, these little victories, you have to tote them up and remember them. And, uh, I remember, you know, I'm sure you do this with every patient or the staff does. You put up these uh, to-do lists and, and, and they're goals that you have to accomplish. Like you're saying, so many calories that you can eat so you don't have to be tubed um, or steps that you walk, you know, in, in your rehab um, or that you can brush your own teeth. Uh, and so all these, you know, goals, I was so delighted, of course, when, you, when you're able to achieve them. Um, and I remember you, you were great because I had a problem with, um, I was too eager in some ways to like, you know, to help out in physical therapy and PT. So I would leap out of bed sometimes. Like they call it launching. And I'm <laughs> sure that's a, I don't know if it's a clinical term or not, <laughs> but uh, I launched often and I'm like, whoa, big fella, I, you know, <laughs> it almost fall down. And so you uh, wrote on my uh, mirror, which is great because, you know, the big mirror uh, yeah. in my bed, um, you wrote a tortoise instead of the rabbit. You know, they go slow. <laughs> you have to go slow. And, you know, my family was funny because uh, they were reading to me from Wind in the Willows at the time. And Toad was like a character from Wind in the Willows who they've often compared me to because I, I tend to be kind of like um, have manias that take me over, <laughs> you know, grand schemes and that kind of thing. And hey, some work out and some don't. But uh, I am kind of Toad-like uh, and uh, kind of impetuous. So you found, I think, a clever way of of warning, I was kind of, in, you know, reminding me every day just to take things slowly. Yes, well, we, we definitely don't want men falling at our feet in the hospital. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like as I've, as I've gone, uh, as, as I've moved further past my 20s and 30s and into my 40s, I have to trip them outside of the hospital, um, <laughs> but definitely not inside. And so, so yes, uh, you moving more slowly uh, definitely helped our heart rates and, um, <laughs> Well, to keep you off the floor. Uh. I was amazed by Nella, uh, who's one of my, at the time, uh, physical therapist. And I don't know how tall uh, Nella is, but I, I, I felt huge to when, I, when she was working with me because I think she was half my height. Uh, yeah. I'm about six feet. Um, no, she's taller than that. But uh, she was amazingly strong. And whenever I began to teeter, she would, it's an arm would shoot out and grab me and pull me back to, to my center space. And uh, she was so good at that, you know, and, and of course also like you, pushing me every day to do a little bit more, to do sit-ups, you know, to walk a little further. And it's, I can't stress how um, physically tiring it is in the beginning. And I think what you do so well at the stroke ward was to have people up right away working, you know, beyond what they think their limits are even to push themselves mentally and physically. And I know that you've, you know, the, the philosophy is that the, the brain is plastic and can be uh, in some ways is most, uh, you know, is most primed at that point to adapt and to, and to rebuild itself. And, uh, so, you know, it's very important within the first, you know, few days to really push a patient. But that must be tough, too. How do you do that when a patient's, like, growling at you and doesn't uh, want to do it? You know, well, it's, it's, it can be challenging. I mean, we, we try to enlist family. Uh, um, you know, if, if uh, you know, we're seeing someone at, at one of the worst points in their life, 
right? And um, it's understandable if uh, mood is a factor. Um, and so, you know, we try to encourage their variety of ways um, or enlist family. I mean, that also became very hard during and challenging during COVID when we couldn't have families in the hospital um, uh, for a period of time. Well, let me ask you about that because that I, that I, I can't imagine that, how tragic that would be for a patient. I, as we've talked about, having family there was so vital for me because it's pretty lonely often, you know, on the weekends, particularly yeah. when you, the staff is gone or late at night. So how, you, how do patients deal with that now during the, uh, the, the, the shutdown? I mean, I, I think better than earlier in the year um, when there were no visitors. Uh, you know, I, I believe probably in the ICU there was um, end of life special circumstances. Um, but it was a challenge, you know, for some of our patients who were impaired cognitively and or had language impairments who so had difficulty with comprehension, um, their knowledge was they saw their family and then one day they were just dropped off at Davies and they didn't see them again. Um, so, you know, I think our staff did a great job um, with being creative, um, FaceTiming, you know, we did a lot of FaceTiming, um, a lot of calling of families outside of therapy or using FaceTime even during therapy. Um, if a patient had their own device, we, um, just for HIPAA, we couldn't use any, we don't use any of our devices. Um, but, you know, filming a therapy session um, on their iPad, their iPhone, or our Android, and then um, uh, sending those clips. Um, or, you know, I mean, I would have meals with patients and I'd have the iPad set up and the patient's wife was there and, and the patient was there and, you know, all three of us are not chatting because I didn't want him to choke or aspirate, but you know, it, it, it was, it was challenging. Uh, um, you have people who are already um, going through something uh, and then going through it alone. I mean, we can, we can be there for someone, but we we're not the same as having close friends or family there. Um, yeah. David and Rebecca, this is Catlin and I would like to lob a few questions sure. to the from our audience. So for David, well, he's <laughs> stepping away for a minute. Here he comes back. I'm back. Okay. In his chair. <laughs> I, just, I, I didn't even want to interrupt. This was such a good dialogue, but we do have a few questions. So first for David, what did you find the most challenging during your recovery, the physical or the verbal retraining? Mm. Well, I was think I would say both <laughs> were great challenges. And even after I came home, on the verbal, I my face uh, I had, uh, you know, was uh, was partly paralyzed on one side, and so uh, my mouth was crooked. Uh, I had to have a therapist come, uh, you know, two or three times a week. And I was icing my cheeks, you know, to try and stimulate the nerves. Um, and there were speech, uh, again, uh, kind of drills, some of which uh, Rebecca had given me and some they gave me after the hospital to, uh, to learn how to enunciate more clearly. Mm -hmm. And because I tend to speak very rapidly, and that, of course, is my doom. Or when I get tired, I'm still, I can, you know, mumble or mangle words. And, and in the beginning, there was a lot of what from my family and friends, you know, and now there's much less of that. Even on, you know, your remote control with your voice recognition for TV, when I tried to like name certain shows, I wanted to watch the TV, the remote would go, what the hell are you talking about? So, you know, that I don't get anymore. Um, so, yeah, I was still a work in progress even after the hospital for m many weeks, if not months. Um, you know, the, re the physical rehab was also very difficult. As I said, I couldn't walk at all. At first, I had to relearn how to walk, to swallow, to eat, um, to go to the bathroom. I mean, all the sort of basic human functions, bodily functions. And I remember my first you know, weeks I came home, I had a, a walker and uh, on, you know, wheels and walked up and down uh, in my, uh, in my house, you know, for like, you know, I had to do it several times a day. And my dog Brando, who's so loyal, he would follow me, you know, behind me. Every step I took to make sure I didn't fall or whatever it was. He's he was such a sweet, 
kind of uh, companion. Um, he's sadly no longer with us. Um, but anyway, I devoted a chapter to Brando as well. So, you know, I, I felt that I needed another year, at least a year after I came home from the hospital to rebuild myself both, I think, uh, verbally as well as, uh, you know, my, my, my body able to walk again in a, in a way without being afraid of falling. Thank you. And for Rebecca, um, he already named some obstacles that he managed through, but do you remember some other big obstacles uh, that David got through under your watch? Um, you know, the, I mean, other than the obvious, the, the speech and swallowing, I mean, my, you know, we talked, David, you just talked about speech. My primary concern for you was swallowing. And I think a, uh, a big obstacle as your therapist was your, um, confidence and and um i don't want to say anxiety but kind of i mean it was like david eat the ice chip and you had a very real fear because choking and aspiration were um significant concerns but you know i i think eventually you gained um the, the confidence and that that was a a challenge just I, I feel like we could have gone to gary danko i have no connection to gary danko <laughs> i should disclose that uh, but i could have laid out a whole feast and um, you probably would have, oh, look at that carrot puree. I'll, I'll yeah. take that. So I think um, sometimes, you know, uh, in general, the challenge is uh, an individual's own confidence. And I think, David, that was something that, um, that you worked through very nicely and it was understandable, um, but it was something I didn't anticipate. You know, in a way, uh, you're right. There was a real fear of, of, of eating anything, swallowing, because I was definitely afraid of choking to death. And after a point, it became like, what are you afraid of? If you don't eat, you're going to die anyway. So it was like, that became an even bigger fear that I would be put back on a feeding tube. Mm -hmm. When they took me off the feeding tube, you know, unless you keep up a certain level of calories, um, you know, they put you back on the tube because you, you're starting to waste away. So I think it was the fear of the tube <laughs> that forced me to eat more. But also, you know, you have to give up some of your fear uh, of, of physical fears. And when you're in the hospital with a serious uh, problem and uh you know i was afraid of needles before and you, hey you get over that fear pretty quickly because <laughs> you're you're going to become a, a pin cushion, pin cushion. You know? <laughs> so David, you had said yeah. that your family has obviously been a strong motivation throughout your recovery what are the other motivations throughout your recovery to date um your writing anything else what are my challenges today Motivation. No, what, what has kept you motivated throughout your recovery to date? You know, um, the, the sense, as I said earlier, that I'm not going to be around, you know, for forever. Uh, and that there are certain things I want to get done. Uh, it's more about my family, though, and, and loved ones than it's about me. I want to see my son direct another movie. I want to see my younger son graduate and, and pursue his career. Uh, you know, my oldest son, Joe, is in LA, LA now, and he's fallen in love, really deeply in love for the first time. So I, I'm looking forward to meeting this young woman at Thanksgiving after they've all safely quarantined. Uh, my wife got interrupted, uh, and she was writing a beautiful book, she still is, about Robert Louis Stevenson and his kick-ass American pioneer wife, Fanny. It's a great book. It's like, it reads like a historical novel. I can see it as a, you know, a masterpiece uh, series. In fact, BBC's already expressed an interest in it. It's so fun to read. So she had read maybe half of the book by the time uh, I had my stroke, unfortunately, which totally derailed her. She spent the next year and a half helping me, uh, you know, put me back together again. So um, I was very, felt very guilty about that, that it distracted her, but she's back to work, thank God. She's written about two thirds of the book now. She's making progress again. And uh, so I want to see that. So I guess the motivation is like, you know, I want to see what the people I love and care about, what, they, what they're going to do next. What would you say then is the next direction of your own work? 
I want to write a historical novel for the first time in my life, I want to write fiction, in part because I had such fun writing the memoir. You know, I, I love writing these big history books that I've written about the Cold War, about the Kennedy brothers, about uh, the history of San Francisco, but you're so tethered <laughs> to reality, uh, you know, and to research and your files and your, you know, to your details because the worst thing you know you can be accused of as a historian is to, to get things wrong so and in my case my books were controversial at least a couple of them so um i needed to be very careful as i did my research and as i wrote the books and as a writer you want to gallop you know it's like talking about earlier you want to launch you know you don't want to take it slowly but as you're writing a history book you have to be very calculated you have to be very painstaking and so you never get to gallop as a writer. Uh, I know in fiction has its own challenges um, and writers also write very painstakingly often there. But I know that when I wrote my memoir, I was not as tethered to, you know, sort of my files and, and my volumes of research. I could draw on my memory, I could draw on my feelings. Um, that's the kind of writing I enjoy more now. So. I have just written what I think will be my last history book uh, in league with my sister, Margaret, who's at the New Yorker. And it's uh, a, a series of seven profiles of heroes who are uh, from the second American revolution in the 1960s and 70s. And these are people who I had the good fortune and Margaret did of interviewing many of them before they died. Some Dennis Banks from the American Indian movement. I think I did the last interview with Dennis Banks. Um, and so these are people I think we need to learn from today. Uh, and I think, I hope that this book is not only inspirational, but very instructive because these are portraits of people at turning points in their lives that changed American history. And uh, so that book will come out next year. We are just wrapping it up right now. I just have to write the introduction. Margaret's writing her last chapter. And then it's off to the publisher. Harper Collins will publish it next May. Um, and then, as I say, I want to focus on writing fiction. In terms of your writing, in terms of everything you've been through, what, it's, it sounds strange to say to somebody who's been through this journey, but of course, you're going to understand this. Has there been anything good from this? I think you've already addressed that, but I'd like to hear further what you have to say about that. Yeah. I a lot. That's good. And I, 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 let me just actually plug the book. <laughs> this is the book. I was waiting for that. <laughs> um, Rebecca's in there. Um, yeah. David, no, could you hold? Could you hold that up again and uh, yeah. let the audience see and hear the title? It's Between Heaven and Hell, published by Chronicle Books. Actually, a little just, higher, David. Oh, okay. Yeah. How's that? And tilt it a little bit. Yeah. How's that? Good? A little better. Good. Yeah. Um, well, as I write in my book uh, that I felt uh, resurrected and I felt like I now uh, was given a new life, a new chance. And not everyone I know is given that chance. People in my family never had that chance, I know. Um, and I certainly now we see with this plague, the current plague, COVID, um, there are many, many people, over 200,000, who never got a second chance. Um, and so, and even those who are coming out of the hospital with COVID um, often are, are badly damaged. They have lung uh, damage, they have heart damage, and, and even brain, I think, damage. So, um, you know, I feel a, a particular uh, empathy for all of these people. And, uh, and so, I feel like, uh, as I say, that I liked my new self in many ways better than my old self. I felt liberated in some way from the carcass of my old life. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm sure people who've had near-death experiences have had this feeling as well, that you say, you must say goodbye to your old self because if you've stayed, you know, strapped to the person you once were, um, then it's going to be just endless frustration. And my, I mentioned Dr. Key, Michael Key, earlier, and he was saying that this is a particular problem among his younger patients who've had strokes. They used to, they're used to like, you know, working for, you know, ungodly hours, you know, crunching numbers and, and coding. 
and uh, they can't do it anymore. They can't do it with the same crazy pace. And it really depresses them that they are not the kind of work machines they once were. But you have to give that up. And even me with my writing, I used to write, you know, maybe 1500 good words on a good day, 2000 good words a day. And that took about six hours of hard work. And at the end of the day, if you're a serious writer, your brain feels like a fist that's been clenched all day long. That's what you're doing. And there's some days you don't even get up from the, your screen that often, which you should obviously walk around and exercise and talk to people. But at the end of the day, that's why writers drink because it's the quickest way to unclench that fist. And um, so in the old days, I used to, I mean, my book, The Devil's Chessboard, which I think is my white album. I think it's my best thing I've ever done. And it's the most important thing. It's about what went wrong to America. And it explains why we're in the dilemma we are today. Hey, David, uh, give that title a shout out again so our audience uh, knows that title too. Yes, it, The Devil's Chessboard. And it's, uh, it's a history of the CIA and Alan Dulles, who was the legendary spy master who created the CIA and ran it during much of the Cold War. Um, and so that kind of secret of power, that kind of... Un, uh, power that doesn't have any kind of controls uh, or public oversight, I think is uh, a big reason why America is in the dark place it is today. Uh, in any case, um, I wrote that book at a kind of crazy speed. I wrote uh, Season of Witch at a kind of crazy speed because it, for a different reason, it was inside me, these stories I used to tell my kids about the, the crazy history of San Francisco came pouring out of me. But nowadays, a good day for me is if I write 500 good words instead of 1,500 or 2,000 and, or 800 at the most. And that's, a good, that's a, you know, a good pace. And so that's something you have to like, you know, adjust to, that I can't write as much. My stamina is not as strong anymore. You know, I get more tired ease, uh, more easily. Um, and, you know, I still think I write. In some ways, I write more acutely than I used to. I, you know, I do these warm-up exercises, exercises on Facebook, where, and I'm going to start my own blog soon. But for me, they're uh, important kind of finger exercises like a, a piano uh, player does every day. And so um, I think it is important to keep using your brain, uh, particularly if you had, you've had the kind of experience I've had. But, um, you know, that's what I'm doing. I think, David, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rebecca. No, please. Just, um, you know, when I was reading your book, and I just, I just double checked it, but your phrase, my strokes give to me. And, you know, which I think is wild. I, when I read it the first time, and I was like, well, that's, I've, I've never honestly heard someone characterize their stroke that way, or, or you know, and I thought that was pretty, um, pretty powerful. And, and how, how it has changed things for you. Yeah. It's your it, gift. It is, it's a dark gift. And it, put you in a, it puts you in a place that in some ways is, is frightening. And even today, you know, there, there's a song that I was playing during my stroke. And I quoted from it on a Facebook post that I posted in the middle of my stroke, which as I said earlier, was a, this weird 48 hour stroke. And, um, and I heard that song the other day and sent chills up my back because I, I hadn't heard it since the day of my stroke. So even now, there are things that will take me back to the terror of that first 24 or 48 hours. And, uh, and even the convalescence has its moments of great terror uh, because you don't know to what extent you'll come back. But as I say, if once you learn to accept who are you becoming? You go into a secret place in a way, a new place that's very comforting and very different. And in a way, it's like a place where I think most people can't even understand. Maybe people even in the stroke world can't understand completely unless you actually have experienced this kind of brain trauma. You become unique to yourself in a new way. It's like you are suddenly a newborn and um, I 
don't mind being re reborn that way. I, 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 I thought my life didn't have any more surprises left to me after 67. I think I'd, I thought I'd seen it all. And yet this was really the beginning of a whole new, I think, uh, experience. I still feel that way. I never want to let go of that. That's important to me. I've heard this from other stroke uh, survivors. They don't want to let go of this unique, strange, weird, psychedelic place that they've gone that you know others have not gone. So yeah, I still feel weird, you know, and I don't mind feeling weird. And if you can accept being weird, you know, you walk, I walk into a room, you know, I'm on a cane, I'm different, you know, I'm not the same sort of take charge guy I used to be. I used to run a company, you know, I was a political activist. I was kind of an alpha male dude. Um, and I don't mind saying goodbye to that, or at least a big part of that person. And um, I like being in a kind of weird, strange new place. As a writer, you have to. <laughs> well, I've only known you since your stroke, and I find you just grand. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. I yeah. want to thank well, both of you tonight, Rebecca Riley, David Talbot. We could probably go on all night. This has been amazing. And one of our listeners said, and I totally agree, and I'll bet everybody else does too, that this dynamic between the two of you has been extraordinary. A lot of compassion understanding and encouragement between the two of you. I really, really want to thank you on behalf of Institute on Aging for being here with us tonight. Um, if there are any closing remarks you'd like to make, that would be great. We're at the six, beyond the 630 point, but please uh, wrap it up in any way you'd like right now. Um, David? <laughs> Well, I, I, again, I, I want to say that uh, I'll always be grateful to Rebecca and uh, particularly Rebecca. I think her spirit was, you know, so unique and, and her skills and, and her determination were so, I think, important to me. And, you know, it's like a school kid comes back and tells a teacher later, you know, and they don't realize how important they've been to someone. But Rebecca and, and several of her colleagues uh, who I name in the book, were of, of huge importance to me. And I'll always be grateful. So I'm so glad that we got to share a Zoom together, Rebecca. And, uh, you know, because I think it is this weird bond you have with uh, your, your, your uh, therapists, your caretakers, whatever. And uh, I certainly felt that uh, from you. And I felt that, yeah, you were just kind of coaching me and cheering me on. And without that, I don't know what would have happened. So I'm very grateful to the Davies and, and, and to you in particular. Um, well, thank you. Uh, and, you know, I'm sorry I met you in the hospital. Um, but I am glad uh, that I got to meet you. Um, and feel so thankful that you've uh, allowed me to be a part of this journey that you've been on. It's, uh, you know, it's been... Um, life-changing for me and we talk about in the hospital how strokes are life-changing um if, you know if you're on acute rehab and it has been life-changing for me since when i first met you and i'm still learning from you and and growing uh you know as a person and and also as a therapist um but again thank you for letting me be a part of it thank you rebecca Thanks to everyone who tuned in tonight. If anybody is looking for continuing education units for this great talk, I'll be sending those out within the next week or so. Again, David and Rebecca, thank you ever so much. It was great to have you. Thank you, Catelyn. Thank you, thank you everyone. Okay, take care, everybody.